Okay, hey guys, and welcome to another great week at the Underwater Realm video blog. This is week 28, and this week we're going to be answering some questions about the sets and props that had to be manufactured on the run-up to the test shoot in Shepparton Studios a couple of weeks back. So first off, we know we need to manufacture a set to do this shoot, and this set needs to imitate the sea floor. Um, so first off, we have to start with the sand. In order to not just have it look as if we've tipped a load of sand on the floor and it's completely flat, we need to create kind of a rolling, undulating sea floor, which means on basic calculations, a 4 meter by 4 meter area, which is what we need, to a depth of 6 inches is going to require around about 4 tons of sand, which is more than we can afford, more than we have space for, and more than we can transport from the southwest up to the M25, because it's obviously very heavy, more or less 4 tons in fact. Um, so we decide that we need to find out an alternative that we can use much less sand and still have the same effect. And the idea that we settled upon is a framework of polystyrene, which we're then going to put a, a top layer of sand over the top. Now, polystyrene is used in the industry um, for big set builds because it's lightweight, it's fairly cheap, and it's fairly easy to work with. Um, and pretty much from there we made the decision that polystyrene is where we're going to go, but it turns out there are some really, really tricky things that you have to get your head around, so we're going to talk you through a couple of those difficult lessons. First of all, we ordered a huge block of polystyrene. The reason we didn't order it pre-cut and pre-made was because quotes were sky high. We're talking about £1,500 to manufacture this amount of polystyrene shaped to our personal specifications. So we ordered just a big old block of packaging polystyrene. It's 8 foot by 4 foot by 2 foot and we figure, hey, we're just going to cut it up ourselves. Um, but of course the way you cut polystyrene traditionally is with a hot wire cutter. Uh, a lot of people have experience of doing this exact same thing with small kind of modeling polystyrene whereby the thing is the size of a hacksaw and just passes a very small 12 volt current across a piece of nichrome wire. Now nichrome wire is exactly what you might find in your toaster. It's the stuff that goes orange when it gets really, really hot and makes your toast toast. Now if you get a longer length of this heated up you can use it to cut through polystyrene. But because we've got such a big piece of polystyrene we need a really big piece of nichrome wire which is cheap and easy to get hold of on the internet. But it means you need to pass a much bigger current through it. Early tests we put 12 volts across it, nothing happened and so we realized very quickly that we were going to have to pass a mains current across this thing. So we manufactured a jig, obviously metal expands when it gets hot so in this jig we included a spring, we included a weight and we had the nichrome wire going from the ceiling to the floor of the garage and we were going to pass this large block of polystyrene through it and cut a number of even sized chunks. Um, all was not well, however, when we passed a mains current across this length of nichrome wire, there were about two seconds where we thought we'd accidentally manufactured a lightsaber. It glowed hotter than the sun, created a large heat distortion around it, and then instantly evaporated. So, back to square one. Um, eventually, we managed to figure out that uh, by rigging four car batteries together to produce a series of 48 volts, and we can generate exactly the right amount of current and therefore the right amount of heat to slice through this thing like a blowtorch through butter. So eventually, um, clad with uh, rubber gloves and mole grips, we managed to pull a length of this wire through the polystyrene and actually slice it into a number of 3 inch thick 8x4 boards, which we then look at our top down map that we manufactured using a uh, free piece of software called Google SketchUp, which I highly recommend you pick up, um, and we cut the pieces to shape and manufactured our framework. We numbered them, we labelled each edge that had to connect, and then assembled them on set as you saw a couple of weeks ago, and pinned them all together with chopsticks. We then tipped one tonne of sand over the top, raked it out, and Bob's your uncle, you have your seabed. No seabed, of course, is complete without large rocks. Um, and in fact, the storyline dictated that the, the aerialists interact with those rocks during the test shoot. Unfortunately, the only polystyrene we'd managed to get hold of at such short notice, we're now three days before the test shoot, was packaging polystyrene, which most of you will be familiar with because it has very large bobbles, about two or three mil in diameter. Um, and whenever you hit it or chip it, the bobbles go everywhere. And it's very, very difficult to affect a smooth surface with this stuff. So you can't just cut and chisel and sand and create a rock texture. So we're very, very worried at this point that we've got something that's always going to look like polystyrene. And there's nothing worse than a rock that looks like it's made of polystyrene. So after a few hours of very fine detail sculpting that Shaz did with some very delicate tools that we refer to as a crowbar, a claw hammer, and a hand axe, um, he actually managed to take a number of the sharp edges off this block of polystyrene, and we went over it with a tool called a heat gun, which is effectively like a, a kind of industrial strength hairdryer. Again, it's a nichrome wire. 
inside an element with a uh, with a fan that can just blow heat or whatever you point it at. And by melting the surface of this polystyrene, it actually takes away that bobbly texture and it creates a really nice kind of eroded, weathered texture, which worked really well for this rock. And with a short undercoat and then a top coat from the spraying a mist of, of spray paint over the top, you can create a really, really interesting effect. Dress it up with a few barnacles and a few limpets and then a little bit of seaweed. And Bob's your uncle. You have a rock to sit on your seabed that registers really, really nicely on camera. Now it should be noted that with all of this work with polystyrene, a lot of fumes that are given off are actually toxic. So if you are going to um, do any of this at home, be very, very careful with electricity and make sure you do anything with polystyrene in a well-ventilated area because it is toxic. So with the set manufactured, um, we moved on to props. First of all, a spear that the main character had to carry, the tip of which was made of swordfish bill, which is the large sword-shaped bone at the front of a swordfish. Um, also a corset or a piece of armour around the midriff of our aerialist, which was supposed to be manufactured of whale leather. Now, obviously we don't have a, a very huge supply of swordfish bill or whale leather down here in the southwest, so we had to manufacture these things. And again, the sort of time scale we're on, we're about five days before the test shoot at this point. So uh, it was a little bit of a challenge. But this is Shaz's area of expertise, and so uh, Shaz went ahead and sculpted the, uh, the shape of this swordfish spearhead in Plaster of Paris. Now Plaster of Paris is really really easy to work with but very very brittle. There's no way that the final prop could ever have been made of this. So he sculpted the original in Plaster of Paris. We then manufactured a box around that, suspended the Plaster of Paris sculpture inside and poured in a silicone resin which was actually, um, it would then set or cure around that sculpture. We could then slit, remove the original sculpture, bind it back together with pressure and then pour in a polyurethane resin, which is a much, much harder substance. Um, Demold that a couple of hours later, and you've got yourself a polyurethane replica of that original plaster cast. You can then chip into that, paint that, weather it, age it up, but it's a very, very, very hard substance there, which we then used for the final prop, and I think you'll agree, quite a, a lovely piece of sculpture there by Shaz that, uh, that mimics the swordfish bill that the Atlanteans would use as a weapon. Once the uh, the swordfish bill was complete, we then moved on to the whale leather. Now this gave us a number of different headaches, um, and uh, while researching it became very obvious that there are a number of different types of whale leather and different types of whale, obviously. Um, but the skins are so varied that it's very difficult to get a handle on exactly what it should look like. So we went back and read original um, original notes by a number of biologists. Um, there was a famous biologist called Stella who discovered something that was then named the Stella sea cow, um, which was a, a creature that's now extinct, um, but he described its skin as being similar to the bark of a rough tree. And, and rather than a membrane, it was almost like an armor to protect it from sharp rocks as it swam around the ocean. So we really liked that, that image as something that these people might manufacture armor from themselves. So we, uh, we started out with tree bark. Um, we got the gnarliest, roughest tree bark we could find. Uh, obviously it's very, very thick and very curved, but by putting it in a box with a, uh, a steamer, the sort you might use for, uh, say for example, um, wallpapering, we managed to heat up that sap to a point that it became flexible, straighten the thing out, put it under weight, and allowed it to cool. Came down the next morning, and we've got lovely straight sheets of tree bark. We then cut them into shape, and Shaz then applied a, another sculpture layer of an oil-based sulfur-free clay, uh, which he sculpted a number of fine details into um, creases in the skin and scratches from, from repeated use, this sort of thing. Um, with then a final sculpture made of wood and oil-based clay, obviously this is no good for manufacturing armor or even part of a costume from. Um, so a very similar process was applied. It was laid on a tray with a wall of clay around it, uh, again oil-based clay, and then the silicone was poured in over the top of this sculpture uh, and filled up to a depth of a couple inches. We then leave the silicone to cure, peel away the clay wall, peel back the silicone and remove the wood and clay and you have a negative of that sculpture left inside the silicone. By mixing up a similar polyurethane mixture, rather than a polyurethane resin we were using a polyurethane foam which is very spongy, it's the sort of thing like dog toys are made from. Um, so we pour that in and it expands into that, into that uh, original cast and then a couple of hours later when that's cured, pull it out and you have a polyurethane foam version of that original sculpture. A quick undercoat with a matte black and then a very very fine repeated dry brush with uh, with increasingly light tones of grey 
um, Shaz managed to paint this thing up to look uh, like a, a wonderful, wonderful textural piece of this leather. A couple of applications of barnacles and limpets, and Bob's your uncle. Repeat five times, and you have a corset that appears to be made of whale leather, along with a swordfish bill spear and an entire seabed set. Now, obviously, I've glossed over this in a, a matter of minutes, but uh, if anybody has any questions on any of the other pieces of props or any specifics, we'd be more than happy to help out. Send your questions through, or if you've got any other interest in the area of silicone molding go and check out brick in the yard there'll be a link below the video but they're massively helpful and nothing that we do here could be possible without the uh, the support and resources that are available online so big thumbs up to everybody that's helped us out along the way um, hope you like everything you've seen and we will catch you next week when we go a little bit further into our journey towards creating the underwater realm